Canon Convex optimization be robust? Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, and thanks everyone for coming. So uh, I will be talking about can non-convex optimization be robust? So this is going to be based on joint work uh, with uh, Yu Cheng, Chi Jin, Michael Jordan, and Li Dia Liu. So all of them are either here or locally at uh, Berkeley. So first, uh, before talking about robustness, uh, let's first look at why do we care about non-convex optimization. So non-convex optimization is really used everywhere in machine learning. Whether you are doing something more traditional like learning a probabilistic model, or you are doing deep learning as many other people are doing, uh, finding the right parameters for either the model or the neural network usually requires you to solve a non-convex optimization problem. Um, so there's a difference between theory and practice of non-convex optimization. In theory, Traditionally, people have thought that non-convex optimization, since non-convex optimization is NP-hard in general, let's better avoid this problem and just try to uh, solve the problem by using some convex relaxation. Uh, but in practice, that's not what people do, right? In practice, people didn't care about the fact that non-convex optimizations are NP-hard. Uh, in fact, people just run very simple algorithms like gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And this algorithm actually turns out to solve the practical problems uh, fairly reasonably. Uh, so why do we, so why is there a difference between theory and practice for non-convex optimization? Well, of course, we still don't have a complete answer. But uh, recently, uh, many researchers, uh, including myself, we've been trying to understand this from a, a perspective of optimization landscape. So we say that non-convex optimizations are easy in practice, uh, partly because many of the objectives that people are trying to optimize in practice are very simple. And uh, in this talk, I will call these objectives locally optimizable objectives. So what do I mean by that? Uh, these uh, objectives will have two very nice properties. So the first property is that for all of these objectives, all the local minima are equivalent. They have the same function value, and they are all globally optimal. Uh, as you can see in this function, we have two local minima, and they are equivalent. Uh, in practice, this phenomena is, uh, usually happens because of some symmetry within the objective function. We'll see more examples later, but just for this particular function, uh, it's clear that the function is symmetric with respect to uh, reflection over the y-axis. Uh, so another property that we require for these functions uh, is that these functions should not have any high order saddle points. Uh, so by that I mean every saddle point of the objective function should look like this. So this is a very typical saddle point. Uh, this is a point uh, which has zero gradient and has a Hessian matrix whose smallest eigenvalue is uh, strictly smaller than zero. So if I follow the negative eigen direction, the function value is going to decrease. Uh, what we don't want are cases like this. So this is a particular function uh, with, where this point at zero uh, will have zero gradient and also zero hashin. Uh, so just by looking at the first two orders of derivatives, you will not be able to tell whether this point is a saddle point or a local minimum. But as you can see from the picture, it is not a uh, local minimum. And these kind of saddle points are called high order saddle points, and we assume that uh, the objectives do not have these high order saddle points. So under these two nice properties, uh, there are many algorithms that are known to be able to find a local minimum efficiently. Uh, for example, our previous work showed that gradient descent can find an epsilon approximate local minimum, or uh, sometimes called an epsilon, approximate, uh, epsilon second order stationary point in uh, roughly one over epsilon squared iterations. Um, so in addition to gradient descent, there are many other algorithms that are known to work in this setting. Uh, and many of these algorithms can actually improve over the number of iterations from 1 over epsilon squared to something like 1 over epsilon to the 1.75. Um, so, so that's good. We know that if the objectives are, have this very nice property, then we have very good algorithms for finding the local and global optimal for these objective functions. So the remaining problem is why are the objectives locally optimizable, right? For what problems can we say that their objectives are locally optimizable? 
Uh, luckily, throughout the years, uh, many researchers have proved several cases of locally optimizable functions. Starting from the canonical example of principal and component analysis, so this is a classical example of a non-convex objective but does not have any bad local optimal solution. Uh, in the recent years, uh, people were able to prove many problems such as matrix completion or tensor decomposition or even some versions of neural networks have this nice locally optimizable uh, objective functions. Uh, usually the guarantees in these new uh, works uh, will look like this. So for a certain problem x, uh, whether it's matrix completion or neural networks, let's say if the input data satisfies certain assumptions, in particular usually if the input data is generated to the, according to some model, then the objective function is going to be locally optimizable. Uh, so that's nice in the sense that we can now say that for all of these functions, their objective functions are easy and we can just use the simplest algorithms to find the global optimal solution for all of these problems. But on the other hand, uh, I always worry a little bit when I see these kind of guarantees uh, and when I prove them myself because we, we always need to make some assumptions because this is a non-convex optimization problem. And I'm worried about what happens if these assumptions are, uh, are not satisfied, right? What if even there are some small perturbations to these assumptions? Um, okay, so what happens when the assumptions fail? Uh, the worry here is that when the assumptions fail, the algorithms, the non-convex optimization algorithms, actually will not fail gracefully as some of the, non, uh, the convex optimization algorithms. So here I'm going to give a very simple comparison. So here this is a classical convex optimization problem. This is just the least squares problem. Uh, think of AI as vectors and BI as numbers. And we are just uh, hoping to find param parameter x, which is the least squares solution over this uh, set of input data AI, BI, right? Uh, on the other hand, for non-convex optimization, let's say we still have input data that's AI and BI, uh, but we are minimizing a non-convex loss function L that's related to this particular sample and the parameter X. In both cases, I'm looking to find the global optimal solution for this unknown parameter X. Okay, so for convex optimization, um, if I think that maybe some adversary were maybe for some reason that I don't have the exact values of AIs and BIs, right? Maybe they are perturbed a little bit by some adversary, or maybe I are uh, even originally I don't know these values uh, with 100% accuracy, right? So uh, suppose there are some perturbations to the parameters AIs and BIs, maybe the objective function will change from this blue function to the red function. Uh, and of course, if this happens, the global minimum is perturbed. Uh, but if, as long as the change in AIs and BIs are small, the global minimum is going to be still fairly close. So that's not ideal, but that's okay. Uh, the good thing about convex optimization is this function is convex not because I have some particular values of AIs and BIs. This function is convex because it's a quadratic function. So no matter how I perturb the AIs and BIs, my objective function is still convex, so whatever algorithm that I use will still be able to find the global minimum. Uh, so what happens for non-convex optimization, right? In, for non-convex optimization, the problem can uh, be much worse because when I perturb these parameters AIs and BIs, say before perturbation, maybe uh, these AIs and BIs come from some models, they satisfy some nice assumptions, so my function is this nice blue function that is locally optimizable. But after the perturbation, uh, there's, no, uh, there's nothing that prevents the function to look like the red function here. Now the problem of the red function, of course, first we uh, still observe that the global minima are perturbed. Now instead of these points, we have these uh, green points. But again, that's probably not a huge problem, uh, even if I find any one of these green points, I should be fairly happy because they are still uh, fairly reasonable solutions for the original optimization problem, right? But the main problem is after this perturbation, this red function is no longer locally optimizable because as you can see, the red function now has a lot of uh, local optima that are very bad. They are, their function values are much larger than the function value of the global minimum. 
so the, the function is no longer locally optimizable. And in particular, if, say, I run gradient descent on this red function, then it is possible that my algorithm will get stuck here. And then I will be really unhappy because this red point is really uh, not a point that I'm looking for. So in some sense, uh, when we are working with non-convex optimization, they are more susceptible to even small adversarial perturbations. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to show you two examples where, uh, under certain assumptions, we can change the algorithms and make <coughs> non-convex optimization robust question. Yeah. So I'm just kind of wondering, is that what the perturbations to a non-convex objective actually look like? Uh, right. Of course, this is just an artificial example. Uh, for this function, I didn't uh, actually write a loss function. Um, uh, and actually try to perturb the parameters myself. Um, yeah, I guess the question is just, you know, I mean, what's, the, what's the right model for perturbation of these losses? I think that's the, it's plausible that that could happen. It's plausible that maybe instead what happens is, you know, the, the left local minimum goes up a little bit, the right local minimum goes down a little bit, but kind of it's still fine. Yeah, so, so, so uh, that, that is certainly possible. So in this talk, we are going to focus on this model, but uh, this is just a one of the examples of what you should, what you might want to do when you are working with non-convex optimization with some perturbations. If you know that the perturbation you have come in comes from a different model, then maybe you should design a different algorithm. And, and uh, for most of the perturbation models, uh, things are still widely open. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean. But he didn't yet define the yeah. perturbation model. Right? Yeah, I, I, like well, in some I, sense, I, this I, is. Like, what, what, what's this? What is this picture meaning? I mean, I, mean, I don't know. I mean, I will show you some more motivations when I uh, go on in the talk. Uh, so, so there are reasons why we believe that uh, we have some function that uh, whose perturbation might look like this. Okay, I also have a question about the first part that that. Uh, Apparently, like uh, deep networks are locally optimizable. No, no, no. This, this, yeah. uh, I mean, I'm not claiming that all deep neural networks are locally optimizable. I'm just saying for a very particular version of two-layer neural network, for a very particular yeah. designed function, it is locally optimizable. But I mean, you can just break the, if you yeah. add a regularization term to your x, which is convex, yeah. and break the symmetry, you can easily break the symmetry. Uh, I mean, the only way a, a function can be locally optimizable is to have a symmetry, right? That is correct. Yeah. So you can easily break it by adding, adding a regularization of x. Uh, we can discuss that offline. It's not as easy. Uh, it's not as easy to break the symmetry. Uh, it is easy to break the symmetry, but you still need to... Uh, uh, but it depends on when you break the symmetry, your, uh, your function might actually have different local optima that have, a, uh, that have different values. How do you guarantee that you find one that is good? It, it's not very clear. I that's mean, I can just question, add. That's my question, actually, exactly. That's my question. So you can easily break. OK, we can talk about Yeah, we, uh, I prefer to take that offline yeah. because that's not the major topic of this talk. Uh, OK, so in the first uh, part, I will talk about what if the adversary can perturb the function value? And I will give you some more motivation on why do we consider the adversary uh, to be able to perturb the function value? In what cases uh, does this make sense? Uh, and in the second part, I will talk about some more uh, concrete models of uh, the adversarial perturbations. OK, so in the first setting, we are trying to do robust non-convex optimization with a perturbed objective. Uh, so in this setting, we have this unknown function capital F, which is the function, uh, the blue function here. Uh, so this function has all the nice properties that you want to assume. Let's say this capital F is locally optimizable. It's smooth in the sense that uh, all orders of derivatives exist and they are bounded. Uh, local minima are very good solutions and finding a local minima of this function F is what I want to do. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, um, although there's this very nice unknown function f, I don't have access to this function. I cannot compute anything uh, on f. Uh, the only thing I have is the input, which is the small f, the red function. Uh, the red function does not have these nice properties. The red function is not going to be locally optimizable. OK, the version I draw here is smooth, but uh, we are not even assuming that. The function small f may not even be continuous. 
Uh, the only thing I know is that for every point x, uh, the difference between the red function and the blue function is bounded by some quantity nu. Um, and uh, our goal is, under this assumption, can we find an epsilon approximate local minimum of the original unperturbed function capital F given access to this red function. Uh, <coughs> and here, uh, just to be more precise, by an epsilon approximate local minimum, I mean that is a point which has a uh, norm of the gradient is less or equal to epsilon, and the Hessian is, uh, in PSD sense, larger than minus root epsilon times identity question. If you do something simple like convolving with some small function, that is... Uh, good question. Uh, that's actually exactly what we do. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, to make that work and with the optimal parameters, you need to be a little bit more careful. So the what case f is measurable at least. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that's right. <laughs> okay, so here's uh, another motivation for uh, for why we are looking at this model. So this uh, this motivation doesn't even have an adversary perturbing things; uh, it just happens naturally. Uh, so this is uh, a problem with uh, empirical risk and population risk. So re remember the definition of population risk is some expectation of some loss function over an input distribution. And in many cases, the input distribution, we can think of it as some nice, uh, fairly smooth distribution, let's say a Gaussian. Uh, and, and as a result, the population risk is often fairly smooth. Um, on the other hand, uh, we, of course, do not have access to population risk because that, is, uh, that requires you to take expectations and uh, we don't have infinite number of samples. So in practice, what we have access to is going to be the empirical risk, which is just the average of these loss functions over the actual samples. And uh, this empirical risk function may not be as smooth as the population risk function. Uh, as you can see in this example, uh, this, uh, the landscape of this empirical risk function is very rough. It has a lot of uh, discontinuities uh, in the gradient, for example. So in many applications, especially uh, uh, for neural networks, the empirical risk may not be smooth in the sense that uh, its gradient does not have a Lipschitz property. That's because for neural networks, the activation function is often the ReLU function. And the ReLU function, when you take the derivative, uh, it jumps from 0 to 1 when you go from negative to positive. Uh, so the ReLU function and uh, loss functions that's related to that usually do not have, uh, say, Lipschitz gradient properties. Um, but on the other hand, even though the empirical risk may not have these very nice smooth properties, uh, we still know that uh, when you have large enough number of samples, the so function values are still pointwise close to each other but by some standard uh, concentration results. I'm sorry, so this problem is a ReLU problem or? Uh, yes, so for new, uh, uh, I mean this problem can be general uh, depending on the loss functions that you choose. But for example, if your loss function includes something applied on a ReLU function, uh, then this would happen. Like a smooth ReLU doesn't have this problem. Uh, right, if you use a smooth ReLU, that's going to uh, not have this problem, but it, uh, depending on how much you smooth it, might have other problems. Does anybody believe that the smooth ReLU is worse than the ReLU? Uh, I don't think it's technically worse. It's just not used in practice, I guess. Uh, it's just easier to compute ReLUs in practice. So, but that suggests that the, rough, this, the Lipschitz property is not the problem, right? The smoothness is not the problem. Oh, well, in some sense, our solution is also suggesting you can just do a smoothing without changing the uh, objective function, right? So uh, in some sense, that's, uh, that, that's the same solution as using a, small, a smooth ReLU. Uh, and the point is, you don't need to compute a smooth ReLU. You can actually still use ReLU and compute a stochastic gradient in that way. Uh, so uh, let me not try to uh, go forward too quickly, uh, but let, let me first state my, uh, our results. Uh, so what we can show is if the original function capital F have all of these nice properties, uh, then uh, if the algorithm ha only has access to a function small f that is pointwise close to the unknown function capital F, then if this di uh, difference new 
is less or equal to something like uh, square root of epsilon cube over rho times one over d. Here rho is just some uh, Lipschitz parameters for the Hessian. Uh, for now, think of it as a constant. Uh, then there is a polynomial timing algorithm that can find an epsilon approximate local minimum of the original function f. What's d? Uh, d is the dimension of x. Uh, yeah, so, so this dependency might look a bit strange, right? Why do we have epsilon to the power 1.5? Why do we have this extra 1 over d factor? But it turns out this is, uh, in some sense, the, the right dependency because we uh, show a matching lower bound. We show that in the same setting, uh, if this difference nu uh, is larger than this bound by a factor of log squared d, uh, again, d is the dimension of x, any algorithm that finds an epsilon approximate local minimum of the original function f with at least constant probability uh, must query this function small f uh, for at least e to the uh, log square d number of times. And of course, e to the uh, log square d is not a polynomial in D, so, so any polynomial time algorithm will not be able to do that. Uh, so our uh, algorithm and uh, our paper is not the first result that considers this setting. So previously, uh, Yu Chen Zhang, Percy Liang, and Moses Sharika uh, give a more complicated algorithm for uh, this setting. They use uh, sampling techniques to solve the same problem. Um, and uh, not only that their algorithm uh, is more complicated conceptually, um, the dependency is also uh, much worse compared to our result. Uh, we actually get the tight uh, guarantee here. Um, OK, so uh, as I mentioned uh, previously, the idea of our work is uh, actually very simple. And it's probably the first thing that you should, would think about uh, when you look at this problem. So the idea is, OK, we have this red function, and that has a lot of perturbations, and it's not very smooth. Uh, so maybe I'll let me just uh, convolve this uh, red function with a Gaussian uh, in order to get rid of these additional bad local minima. Right? So in order to do that, we will define this function f to the sigma of x uh, to be the average of f of x plus c, where z comes from a Gaussian distribution. Uh, with mean zero and variance sigma squared in every direction. Um, so after this averaging, um, hopefully we get this uh, green function here, uh, which gets rid of all the bad local minima, but it still looks very similar to the blue function, so that if we optimize the green function, we are still OK. Uh, so having this definition is very nice uh, in the sense that uh, for this function, of course, naively uh, estimating uh, the value of this f tilde sigma at any, every point might require you to take a lot of uh, queries to the original function small f. Uh, but it turns out that we don't really need to uh, worry too much about that. We can actually compute a stochastic gradient for this smooth function um, just by using two queries. Uh, and that's because uh, the gradient of this function uh, it's not very hard to show that the gradient of this function is just equal to 1 over sigma squared times the expectation over z of fx plus c minus f of x times z. So if I just want a stochastic gradient oracle for this function, I just need to query the function at two points, uh, x plus c and uh, x, and then I will be able to compute uh, this vector. This is not always true for any f. I mean, the lowercase f has to be differentiable, or weakly differentiable. No, no, the lowercase f does not have uh, to be differentiable. The, the capital F needs to be differentiable. So you are claiming, so you are doing integration by parts here, right? So you claim that the gradient with respect to x of f tilde is given by that. Uh, is, that yes. formula, is that formula always true? You need it to be lower than Lipschitz or something. Yeah. You need to be f lowercase f to be weakly differentiable. Yeah, it needs to be Lipschitz. Oh right. Okay, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that that is right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, so the question here is, uh, how large does, uh, uh, how do we choose the sigma here, right? How do we choose a right amount of smoothing in order for this to work? Um, well, uh, uh, more question over there? Yeah. Um, 
if f is locally Lipschitz, can't you just directly compute the gradient by just taking the gradients of f at the random? Uh, yeah, you, well, you can, but for example, you might get stuck here, right? Because even, even if uh, small f here is very smooth. Uh, little, little f does not need to be lo locally Lipschitz or anything. Little f can be just ma measurable, it's fine. Uh, there's no really Lipschitz condition about little f. It's only bounded. It's a convolution with Gauss, so it's... Uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, but for the formula for the gradients, f needs to definitely be more than measurable, but that's... Uh, at least you don't need to be little, little Lipschitz or something. No, but the, that integral, that expectation might not exist, for instance, right? Yeah. That expectation might not exist. Oh, so f, a small f is, so first capital F is assumed to be bounded, so small f is also bounded. So if it's measurable, the expectation okay, definitely exists. Yeah, let's take this off. Question? Well, this just reduced to asking if there is an Edo integral there, right? Isn't that basically what the question, the requirement would be, <laughs> is you're trying to do an Edo integral? Yeah, let, let, let's take this question offline. Um, yeah, so the main question is how large does the sigma needs to be? Uh, and actually there are two uh, different effects here. So if I choose sigma to be too small, then I'm not smooth, uh, averaging over a large radius, then the problem is this green function might look very similar to the red function. And then maybe the lo bad local minima of the red function are still there. On the other hand, if I choose sigma to be too large, maybe this green function will look super different from this blue function, and then optimizing the uh, green function will tell me nothing about the blue function itself. Uh, so we need to carefully balance between these two, and the key lemma we prove uh, is suppose that this function is a smooth version of f of x, then for every point we show that uh, the gradient and the Hessian of the smooth function is close to the uh, original unknown function capital F, and as you can see, both of these guarantees have two terms. Uh, I'm not going to show the calculation, but uh, these two terms come from uh, the use of a triangle inequality. So basically, we first bond the difference between capital F and a smooth version of capital F, which gives the first term. And then we also bond the difference between the smoothed versions of small f and capital F, and that gives the second term. Uh, as you can see, if sigma is uh, too large, then the first term is large and we don't have a good guarantee. On the other hand, if sigma is too small, uh, then the second term will be large. So uh, we choose sigma in order to balance between these terms. Uh, okay, so as a corollary, um, we can just choose the sigma carefully and uh, show that every epsilon over square root d approximate local minimum of the smooth function is an epsilon approximate local minimum of capital F. Uh, so that's for the algorithm, and now let me give you some... So my, my, if the, the intuition I have, the sigma should be the distance between the local minima, that's correct, right? Does it come out like that? Uh, sigma... So just looking at it, it looks like sigma... The good sigma is like a uh, typical distance between the two local minima. Uh, that's not exactly that's correct. correct. Uh, the, the sigma comes from balancing these two terms. But this is a Gaussian noise in very high dimension, right? The, yes. So the, um, basically when you add Gaussian noise in very high dimension, you're gonna go to the, to the S square root D of the points. <coughs> Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, our sigma does have a square root d here, uh, uh, like there's a square root d here. So the total norm of the noise is actually uh, not related to the dimension. Uh, so anyway, let, let me just very briefly talk about uh, the ideas behind the lower bound that we prove. So the idea is actually fairly simple. So uh, almost everything is going to happen within this ball. Uh, so within this ball, we will just pick a random direction v, and we will not, uh, of course, the algorithm will not know this random direction v. Uh, so we will construct a function capital F, such that the capital F only have two local minima uh, within this ball, and both of them are in direction of v, or I guess one is in the direction of v, one is in the direction of minus v. And what we will do is to construct this function in a way such that it is very flat uh, in this band uh, in the middle. So the width of this band, uh, we, are, we are actually going to set it to log square d over square root d if the radius of the ball is going to be one. Uh, so we will make sure that the capital F is fairly flat in this region so that when we perturb the function, 
we can make sure that small f is exactly a constant over this band. So whenever the algorithm queries anything within this band, it just receives a constant, and the constant does not uh, give any information about this vector v. So in order to know anything about the vector v and actually find one of these two local minima, then the algorithm must somehow be able to query a point uh, that is not within this band. Uh, but we all know that this is a high dimensional setting and if the width of the band is log square d over square root d, uh, then the volume uh, of this blue region is actually very, very small. So it, uh, no matter how the algorithm is querying, it needs to make a lot of queries until it hits one of the blue points. And before doing that, it will have no information about what this, what this direction v is. And of course, we need to carefully construct this function and we need to talk about what happens out, outside of this ball, but those can all be handled. Okay, let's go to the next example. So in the next example, I will show you uh, a result about matrix completion uh, against semi-random adversary. Uh, so matrix completion uh, is a very uh, familiar problem maybe to most of people, but let me still introduce it uh, very briefly here. Uh, we have many experts for matrix completion here. So uh, there's an underlying low rank matrix M that we do not know. The only thing we know are some entries of M. Uh, and our goal is based on these observations of M, we want to recover the remaining entries. Usually this is applied to recommendation systems because we think of this as a matrix between users and items. Um, and uh, IJ's entry is just user i's rating to item j. So the reason we think that this matrix might be uh, low rank is because we can think about it, writing it as a product of two low rank uh, factors. Uh, and in this sense, uh, every row here corresponds to an r-dimensional feature for the user. Every column here corresponds to an r-dimensional feature of the item. And the rating is just the inner product of these r-dimensional features. The benefit of this is, of course, on the right-hand side, there are at most two times n times r parameters. So we can hope to recover all the parameters using roughly n times r observations, uh, times log factors. You, uh, so in practice, you actually need to uh, multiply by log. Uh, so how do you solve this problem? The most naive approach is probably just to write a non-convex optimization objective. Uh, the objective is very simple. I'm trying to look for factors at x and y. x is just the first low rank factor, y is the second low rank factor. I want the product x, y transpose i, j to agree with my observations whenever I ha observe an entry, right? So that's the objective. Uh, previously, we were able to prove that matrix completion has this locally optimizable property in the sense that when the number of observations is large and if the observed entries are chosen uniformly at random, then all of local minima are global. Uh, there are, of course, uh, a lot of prior works here. There are many works on convex relaxation or non-convex optimization with carefully chosen starting point. And all of these works actually get better dependency on R, but that's not the main topic of our talk here. Um, the main thing that I want to talk about is a question about what happens if the observed entries do not satisfy this assumption that they are chosen uniformly at random, right? Because if you think about it, the assumption that all the observed entries are uniformly at random is not really reasonable. It, it says for every user I and every <coughs> item J, the probability that user i reads item j is exactly the same. Uh, and that's unlikely because if user i rated item j, uh, then the same user is more likely to read some related uh, items, for example. So there are certainly po possibly some correlations between uh, how are the observed entries chosen, right? Um, <coughs> question? For uniformly random, what yes. if your matrix is sparse? Uh, what if your original matrix is sparse, yeah, right? Sparse? Uh, right. So, uh, so here I'm hiding some details. So in all of these matrix completion works, including ours, there is an assumption called incoherence. And any matrix that satisfies incoherence cannot be very sparse. OK, so uh, what we worry about here is what if the observed entries are not uniformly random? And in particular, we consider a semi-random adversary. So in this model, we assume the input data or the observed entries are generated in a two-step procedure. So at the beginning, 
uh, we think of uh, uh, the instance will start with uniformly random observations. So think of this as a baseline uh, probability. So for every user i and every item j, there's at least a lower bound on the probability p that uh, the user will give the rating, right? So, so this is how we get these ratings. But after that, an adversary can come, and the adversary can choose to reveal more uh, entries. So the adversary is actually fairly limited. Uh, it cannot uh, reveal an entry that's incorrect. So whatever entries that the adversary reveal is also correct. It cannot change any entries that's previously reviewed. It cannot delete any entries. So it seems like the adversary is fairly weak, right? Intuitively, the adversary is only giving the algorithm more information because I now observe more samples. Uh, so why is the adversary doing that, right? In some sense, this is correct because for all the convex relaxation algorithms, it's very easy to show when you have more observations, uh, if you were able to recover the low rank matrix before, you will still be able to recover the same matrix. But unfortunately, uh, if you use a non-convex optimization algorithm, uh, and if your observation comes from a semi-random adversary, then we show that the objective function uh, that we just saw can have a bad local minimum. Uh, and this is not just having a bad local minima. I mentioned that there are algorithms that have very uh, uh, clever initialization algorithms. Even if you use those initialization algorithms, uh, the optimization can still get stuck in these bad local optimal solutions. Uh, so that's a problem, but we also show that there is an efficient preprocessing step that runs in a polynomial in the rank times the number of observed entries in this amount of steps, uh, this preprocessing step will produce a new objective function, and this new objective function will not have any bad local minima. Okay, so let's uh, get some intuitions on how, uh, these, uh, ho how we can prove these. Uh, let's first look at the counterexample to understand <coughs> what can go wrong uh, with these uh, semi-random adversaries. Uh, so here's an example where the objective actually have a bad local optimum. So the underlying matrix is very simple. It's the all ones matrix, right? So of course the solution should be x is the all ones vector. Uh, so now the adversary is going to choose to review more entries in these two diagonal blocks. Okay. Um, so in, uh, by doing that, it actually turns out that this x with ones on this block and minus ones on this block is going to be a local optimal solution. And of course, this is not globally optimal because, uh, as you can see, the off-diagonal blocks are incorrect. Uh, so the reason that this becomes this suddenly becomes a local optima is because this bad solution actually is not discovering the structure of the underlying matrix. It discovered the structure of the observation positions because if I think of uh, the observed positions. Uh, uh, it forms a block diagonal matrix, and this vector is just an eigenvector of that block diagonal matrix. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, if we knew the adversary is changing the probabilities in this way, or is revealing additional entries in this way, we can try to rewrite the entries to say, OK, entries in these diagonal blocks are not so important. The entries in these off-diagonal blocks are more important. So we will try to reread the samples so that the input is actually, in some sense, similar to a random input. Uh, so more formally, how do we do that? Well, in the objective function, we will just add a weight wij in front of each observation's ij. Uh, and we know a good set of weights exist because if I just set wij to be 1 for entries that's reviewed by nature in the first step, and wij to be 0 for anything added by adversary, this function will be the same as before, and it will have the nice properties. But of course, I can't do this because I don't know which entries are added by an adversary. So what do I do, right? So to think about this problem, we actually uh, reformulate the problem as a graph problem. So we think of this matrix, uh, this observation entries, as a bipartite graph between rows and columns. So here, the first row has three observed entries that correspond to three edges in the graph. Uh, similarly, uh, th these are the other edges in the graph. So uh, the previous problem now becomes a graph problem where we start with an artificially bipartite graph, and the adversary will add some more edges. 
Our goal is to recover the original edges that's, that were in the artist any part of the graph. Um, but this is in general not possible because the adversary can just try to add another artist in the graph on top, right? Uh, so instead of actually recovering G, we only need to reweight the new graph so that H is spectrally similar to G, uh, in the sense that the Laplacians have very similar spectral properties. Uh, I'm not, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to give any details. Uh, we give an algorithm that I can actually solve this graph problem in uh, times as m times poly one over epsilon, where m is the number of edges. Uh, our technique is based on these algorithmic techniques developed for graph sparsification, which given a dense graph can produce a sparse graph with the same spectral property. Uh, so there's a long line of work here uh, since the uh, seminal work of Spielman and Tung. Okay, so just uh, to sum up, uh, I showed that non-convex optimization are in general more susceptible to adversarial perturbations because even finding the global optima requires assumptions. When the perturbation is small in magnitude, we show that smoothing can remove the bad local minima introduced by perturbation. Uh, in some other cases for semi-random adversary, we can choose uh, to modify the objective function in order to protect the algorithm. Uh, so there are many open problems, and these are just two very preliminary examples. Uh, so there are many other models of corruption, for example, the Hooper model of corruption that's uh, mentioned many times in this workshop. Can we handle that kind of model when we have a non-convex optimization problem, right? Uh, we also want more efficient algorithms. The algorithms that I talked about are polynomial time, but they are not as fast as their uh, non-robust counterparts. So can we have algorithms that um, uh, have similar performance or at least are very practical in practice. Uh, thanks. Uh, smoothing introduce poly D factors in the runtime. So can we not use these methods to do deep learning that avoids bad local minima or is it, is it not there yet? Uh, I think it's not there yet. Uh. Uh, in your semi-random model for matrix completion, how does the local geometry look like? I mean, the, the local geometry around the global minimum. Oh, uh, that's a good question. So the local geometry actually uh, 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 does not change too much as far as uh, I know. So it's still like restrictedly strong comments? Uh, but I don't know what is the radius of contraction now, because previously uh, it's possible to show a radius of contraction that's fairly large. Now, uh, very locally, nothing is changing, but um, I don't know what happens to the radius of contraction. Uh, sorry, I think I missed it. Do you have a, can you show how the number of entries that's changed by the adversary? Oh, there's no upper bound on the number of uh, entries that uh, are reviewed by the adversary. So adversary can review as many entries as it wants, uh, and the algorithm will still be able to work. Does the algorithm in the first part of the talk work for the semi-random if you don't do the replay? Oh, no. So the algorithm in the first part will not work for the semi-random model, especially because the number of uh, adversarial edges is not even bounded by the number of uh, good edges. So <coughs> for the second part, if I do a simpler thing, which is just to uh, set the Ws so that uh, the weighted degree in every row and column is approximately the same, or equal, maybe. Uh, would that not work? Like, do you have uh, something as sophisticated as what you Yeah, so, so that's a good question. But if you look at this counterexample here, uh, actually already in this, uh, every row and column have roughly the same number of uh, non-zero entries. Uh, so this counterexample is also a counterexample to the degree normalized version. Uh, here, the, the probability P should be constant. Uh, if it's like P over N, uh, no, here this probability p uh, should be at least some log poly log n. Or, uh, well, if the matrix is n by n, this uh, the the base probability, the lower bound on the probability p, should be at least poly log n over n. Uh, 
uh, the probability for these denser uh, diagonal blocks only needs to be a constant factor larger than the base probability. So the amount of adversarial edges added is roughly proportional <coughs> to the number of original edges, actually. So in the first part of the talk, is there a benefit in like reducing sigma um, like as I'm going closer to the optimum? Right, that's, that's uh, radius, um, right. So the question is, does it make sense to uh, maybe start with a large smoothing radius and <coughs> gradually reduce it as the algorithm goes on? Uh, I guess in the worst case, it probably doesn't help because we do show a lower bound. Uh, but maybe there are cases where this actually, uh, because this makes a lot of sense, so maybe there are cases when this actually works. Okay, thanks again.